After attending services for Shavuot. For Shavuot? Uh, Shavuot? Where? Yeah. Uh, actually, I went to Shari Tzion for the second day in the morning and to Bet Torah the first day and the Shabbat before that it had rained so I had went to um, 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 Kol Yisrael yeah uh, it's third avenue Cemento Kol Yisrael Cemento yeah Cemento which I it's my first time there yeah that's actually very close to where I live I live two blocks from there oh really? So, it's a beautiful synagogue. Yeah, that's a new one. We just built a beautiful one here. No, is that the one on uh, Deal Road? Gorgeous. Yeah, beautiful. I, from the outside, it's gorgeous. It is. It's exquisite. Is it a long walk from here? For me, it's about 35 minutes. So I wish it were closer because I would prefer to go there rather than to the Deal Synagogue. And what's the, what's the name of that synagogue? I'm again, David. That's the original name of the synagogue as established by my father, Allah Shalom here. The first synagogue was Magin David on 60, uh, on 67th uh, Street, mm-hmm. between Bay Park, no, between 20th and 21st. Messengers. Mm-hmm. It's right there. It's a beautiful synagogue. It was built. I still remember the parade. I was a baby at the time. I guess about 70 years ago. Mm-hmm. 70, 72 years ago. And it's still beautiful. Very, very. And there's still people there? Uh, yes, not too many, but there are some. Is, that, is Heine Kerry, is that where he goes? No, no more. He used to, he was there till, uh, not too long ago, but he, no, he's, he lives in our area now. Is there some uh, 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 Hazan for No, they don't. It's just my little thing that becomes a Hezbur. So when so Mag and David here just opened recently, didn't it? Yes, they had, the, the building is new, but they had, they had bought a, a very large home on that same land, they bought it, that was a very, very fortunate uh, move that, uh, that we made there. That used to be the headquarters of this movie magnet, for all movie houses, uh, what's his name, he lived in, that was the central headquarters. It was a very, lar- it was a very large home, they knocked it down. And uh, they bought that whole land. I think there must be something like four or five acres of land there. Wow. And they used it for uh, about maybe eight, nine years, ten years. And they built next to it the youth center, which is another low building you see on the side there. And that's very nice, very good. Hmm. And uh, about a year ago, they, they planned this new synagogue. And they have no problems, they got the variants. It's a beautiful synagogue, very, very pretty inside, it's very bright, very airy. But I like the, uh, the philosophy of the congregation there. The rabbi is Rabbi Labaton, Rabbi Ezra Labaton, he's a young rabbi. I heard of him. And, uh, he's like a very active, very. And I'm very happy he is one of my brother David's proteges in Bet Torah. Yeah, I'm sorry? He's he is one of my brother David's proteges. Oh, proteges. oh really? Wow. I, wow. In fact, when he got married, David is the one that made the Shavah Be'achot for him. Oh, wow. He and Rabbi Harari, who the youth, Minyan and Magin in Sha'ar Siyon, both came much under David's influence. And uh, we maintain our traditions by we, I mean, people of our school of thought, particularly my family, and but people of our school of thought, we maintain our tradition, we adhere to our traditions. And, uh, you know, really it's, it's a little the fault of our community in that we didn't have a school of higher education to train rabbis. So necessarily they had to go to Ashkenazi right. institutions. And they, there they became uh, accustomed and imbued with their Hagim. And right now we resent it very much. But that's the way it is. Uh, Rabbi Labaton went to Yeshiva University, as my brother David did. Mm-hmm. But uh, they, they, uh, they adhere to our Minhagim, uh, and uh, 
there's a big conflict in the community now. In terms of big friction, rather, I should say. In terms of these uh, other rabbis who are trained uh, in, uh, say, Baltimore or... Uh, right. Near uh, In planners and places like that. There's, there's a direct conflict. Mm -hmm. Some of our menhagim and our philosophy and we find some of them now with the seal dangling outside or along the old wearing black hats as if that was part of a uniform and we resent it. We don't mind it. I mean, in Florida I have a beautiful minyan where we pray in Olympus. We have a very, very active minyan Baruch Hashem. We have services in the morning, in the afternoon. We have a class every morning after this and that. We have classes on Shabbat for men, for women. Uh, very active. And we have a Lubavitcher, which is maybe half a mile away from us mm -hmm. or so. We support them. Mm -hmm. I, I allow them to come. They speak in our synagogue, the rabbi. We support them financially. Mm -hmm. They're building quite a nice complex where they are. We dedicated uh, some uh, mitzvot there in the name of our uh, minyan. I mean, last year they had a, a banquet. I'm not sure that we took two tables for our Sephardic, we call it the Sephardic, uh, Olympic Sephardic minyan. We support them, but does not necessarily mean that we don't have to, you know, adhere to their minhagim. Mm -hmm. Like you take Rabbi Hecht, who's a Lubavitcher. Right. Also, he says, my Rabbi, Rabbi Schneerson, do not let one of their minhagim go by the wayside. It's every one of them is precious. Their minhagim, you must adhere. That's the congregation. And he does, he adheres to our minhagim. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I, I, I sort of sense that for myself, that the younger generation, or the younger rabbis... Uh, they're all, they're, they're all educated by the Ashkenazim. Right. There's many, many things, some of them minor, others, but, but the problem is that they do create a divisive atmosphere. They're moving, they're moving shoes for the Berchat Kohanim, you know, what, you, what you call Duchat. Duch, right, Duch, right. We make uh, Berchat Kohanim every day. Right. The year, right. and uh, on Yom Ta'anit we make twice a day, right. and so on. And uh, we don't remove our shoes, nor do we wash our hands. Now the Ashkenazim, they make a very big ceremony out of it. They do it what, two, three times a year. Shalosh yeah, Regalim, and Yamim Norai. Right. Two, three times. They make a big deal of it, and they right. wash their hands at the levy, right. wash their hands, and they take their shoes off. And now some of the, our youngsters, they go to Israel for one or two years, which is very nice. In Israel, that's their minhag. Everybody removes their shoes when they make the... Uh, Even the makes the spardine? Yes. That's their minhag. Now, when I go there, I don't remove it. Yeah. And I go and I pray with Hashem Abadeh Yosef in his synagogue. I don't remove my shoes. Last year, I spent Shavuot in Israel. And I prayed in, uh, in Tel Aviv. And the Sephardim, many of them are Lepians. But it's mixed. In Israel, you know, you get a mixture. Uh, I felt obliged to remove my shoes because everybody removed their shoes. All the Kanim, and they all went up to Duchan. I didn't go and wash my hands. So the, they know I'm Kohen and so on and so forth. They invited me to pray at times and so on. Yeah, aren't you going to wash your hands? I said, no, we don't, we don't, we don't have that. So I'm going to wash my hands. Because, I mean, we, we, it's, we, we don't do it. Just, uh, we, the only time we wash our hands is on Kapur Neila. And there's a reason for it. Why? Because we're not allowed to make that. We just wash our hands. Uh, the tips of our fingers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we're not allowed to make that. 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 The Sha'at Neila, when Kapur is practically over, now makes ceremony. And what do we do? We have to stop services for 20, 25 minutes. Or, uh, maybe our forefathers also uh, did it for experience sake or because it was practical. And I consulted with Rabbi Yadid, who was, used to, was the head rabbi in uh, Halab, and is here now. And I, I have a study class with him every morning. That's when agents came from. And uh, although Maran says, you move your shoes, you wash your hands, he says, but our Menhag is before Maran. Mm -hmm. He says, in Halab, Nobody removed shoes. There was only one man that removed their shoes. His shoes. But he removed their shoes. That's arm and hang. But, and maybe it's for experience's sake. Now, you've been in Shari What do you yeah. think if every Kohen removed their shoes and went out to wash their hands? Yeah, it would take 10, 25 minutes. It would take Bedlam. Yeah. Yeah. So we used to, and it was Bedlam on Kapura. And then we passed a new regulation. Stop the Tefillah. We stopped the Hazan. Stop. Let them go. It takes 20, 25, 30 minutes for them to go out. And uh, wash, we don't remove our shoes, just to wash their hands. And they go and they go ahead and put some mazahar, you know, some uh, rose water on their hands. And, and maybe for expediency's sake. 
Oh, maybe you come here on Shabbat and this and this synagogue and any synagogue. We have a lot, maybe because we have a lot of Kohanim, they did away with that. But in any case, the I don't know if you know the background of that uh, of that. Uh, you want to call it the Hag? I don't think it's a Dean. Do you? No, I don't. No, I'm not a Kohen, so I've never. Well, during Bai Chani, Rabbi Hanan ben Zakai established that custom. Uh-huh. During Bai Chani, and that was because the streets were very, very muddy and they were filled with the excrement and the dirt and so on and so forth. And he established then a rule that whoever went up to the Khan, the Kohanim that went up to the Khan only, and since the kind of garments that they wore were these robe garments like, when they raised their hands, the ones under on the Khan, they are more or less on eye level with the, with the Kahan that was standing on the ground. And when they saw their shoes filled with filth and excrement and so on, for Kabbalah Biryot, it has nothing to do with Kedushah. Mm-hmm. For Kabbalah Biryot, so that they should not be disgusted with the view at eye level of these filthy shoes, they passed an edict that the ones that went up to the Khan only removed their shoes. The ones standing on the ground on the Kornatrim mm-hmm. did not move their shoes. And Maran did put it in his Shulchan Aruch. And I'm washing it in the night, we don't have them in the head. If my hands are melechlachim, if they're dirty, how do I put the teflina on? Mm-hmm. How do I stand and pray? Right. If they are, all I've done is that, stood and prayed. I put the teflina to the lid, and I stood and I prayed. Why should my hands be near, right. near, needed to wash? Now, obviously, they stopped to wash if they had to remove their shoes with their hands, maybe. Right. We don't. So, I personally resent it very much. Mm-hmm. Like my cousins. I'm sorry to say they're not knowledgeable anyways. A wheel, though. Mm-hmm. All of a sudden, last year, I say, he moves his shoes, my friend Harry. I say, what are you doing? I'm moving my shoes. I'm like, that's halakha. He doesn't even know how to read. He says, didn't your father and I still know halakha? Then Hakan Hayim told me, I'm talking about mentioning the rabbis and the knowledge of people in the community. Then Hakan Hayim told me, no halakha? Hakan Dweik did not know halakha? Maslaton, the Nato, I'm talking all Kohani, my father, Allah Shalom, no Nakha, your father, the Nato, Allah Nakha, and I mentioned 8, 10. He says, You want to be ashamed of yourself. It's an insult to your father's memory. Hmm. So he's suffering. His brother is more, got him more every So he gets them, he goes up to the Hekha. And it happened. I mean, one other person also was totally non knowledgeable at all, don't know how to read. All of a sudden, something. Why are you taking your shoes off? Well, they do it in the way I pray, and his brother, Wadi, sits. And uh, Ol Yaakov, I think Ol Yaakov, they call it Bet Yaakov, I forgot. Maybe they all remove their shoes. Maybe, maybe they establish that night, and we don't. No, somebody's taking it. Mm-hmm. So first he went up to the first, uh, then he gets a little more gutsy to go up to the second. Now that creates a division. So I, I went up to the to the Dukhan with my shoes. As it happens in Shahre Siyon, I always go up there because we don't fit down on, uh, on all on the level ground. Mm-hmm. So quite a few of us go up on top, and I've always had been a customer, I go right up. So I get up there. I say, hey, have your shoes on? I said, huh, you see? Now all of a sudden, it's become a, 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 a deen. So I can't get up there with my shoes. How come you go up there when you take the Sefer Torah down? I don't understand. There's nothing to do with Kedushat. There's nothing but only for Kabot and Biryot. So now the things, and, but the, 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 the crucial point there is that now it creates a difference. I resent it very much. It's such a small thing, and I always talk about it anyway. Yeah. Hmm. It's interesting. <laughs> when I went for Shavuot and I talked with, with many people, with, um, you know Rabbi Ralph Tell? He's a young man. Yeah, yeah he's, he's, he's met Torah also. also. Yes. Yeah, yeah yes. I thought he would be. And also talking with your, uh, I guess, nephew, um, Isaac Addis. Um, Isaac Addis, that's my nephew, yeah. And they were, they were telling me that the social... Hall that was that's very close to um, Bet Torah um, is up for sale. That, that and, used to be a club. Uh, a social club, right? And they said that the more I guess right wing uh, religious whatever they wanted, to community wanted to take it, and so did people from Bet Torah. Okay. And they said it was just a real bitter battle. And Isaac Addis was very very disturbed by it, really telling me how much it really hurt him. Sort of in the same way that you were describing, just in terms of the divisiveness and the friction in the community. Yeah. See, this rabbi that wanted to take the help, this is the um, Yeshivat uh, Mekbash Mele. Uh, no, uh, 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 Atayret. 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 Rabbi Raful. Rabbi Yosef Raful. And, see, but when he established his 
yeshiva and congregation. See, I, uh, matter of fact, maybe 20 years ago, I had him in my house. I'm inviting him to become the principal. He used to teach in the Flatbush Yeshiva in the high school. He and his brother Abraham Rafur, who's in that other synagogue. In the Kaisel. And as far as his brother, I mean, is off the wall altogether. I mean, he's. What is he from? Uh, Halab. From they're, they're originally their parents is from Halab, but they came from Israel. They were they were born. In Israel. Is it like a, a French accent? No, Israeli. Israeli. Maybe they spoke French there. Yeah. He, he's off the wall altogether. I mean, he's not completely stable. Anyways, his brother, who's younger, is very knowledgeable. He's good. That's very tranquil in Hacham, and very very extremist. And uh, so he used to teach in the flat where she went to high school. Then at one time, I was uh, chairman of the educational committee in Magen David. We were in the process of changing principles, and at the court, I was an Asian man, educated Halabi from our tradition, even if he's not maybe up to everything as far as the uh, uh, educational system and modern system, but you know, he's got something. And I invited him in my house on a couple of people. No, he wouldn't come unless, so because we were called. Rabbi, you're teaching in a college school anyway. This is our community. No, and I spoke to him very roughly. And I said, you know, you people, you come here, you reap the benefits, every benefit that this community has to offer, and you don't feel responsibility that you have to contribute. I spoke to him rough because he just turned it out he wouldn't. But that's his conviction. He wouldn't. Eventually, he said, so I said, uh, an answer to the fact that he was teaching, and then he says, that's not my school. But found, this is my community. My school, I will not... Uh, promote mm. that. Okay, so then he went and established his own yeshiva, which is separated. Okay. But he went by himself out of the community and established his own self. He didn't come, see, for example, we resent Rabbi Dweck, what he's doing very much on this. There's a royal battle ongoing here all the time. He's a rabbi of which city? Of the deal yeah, the deal yeah. And he's a man that also we subsidize his education in Baltimore. He came from Halab, not too long ago. I mean, I guess he must be 45 or so, and uh, he's been here maybe 30, 35 years. He came as a young boy, 12 years old. And uh, he also taught in Magin David Yeshiva for a while. He was a good teacher, strong teacher. And then when they wanted a young rabbi, you know, who better this year? He's a Sefaradi from Halab, background, pop, pop, pop. Let's bring him over here. Little did we know that he was totally imbued with the Ashkenazic uh, philosophy, and he's married to Ashkenazim, a very religious family, observant family, obviously, and that creates a tremendous influence over mm-hmm. him. And, uh, I mean, for example, he has got a, a son, Solomon uh, uh, Shalom, uh, Shlomo, he calls him. Uh, now, that's not us. Mm-hmm. And uh, a couple of times we are marked, he lets a little the seat dangle. Rabbi, you are seat showing you. So started, now, lately, he started putting on a black hat, and it's created such a commotion in our synagogue, such a commotion in the whole community. Why? And that's what, why? Well, also, why? Why are you wearing a black hat? He and his sons. Now he's got two sons, Mar Moshe. They wear black hats, and they said no. And that's rubbing everybody the wrong way. And it encourages. And he's setting up kolel. Another kolel, not standing. We have a very nice kolel here, which where he's. And he's establishing uh, another kolel. Yeah, he established it. Who's the Who's organizing the first? Who has the first kolel? My diamond. Who's he is Ashkenazi, but his uh, mother is. Sefaradi, one of that, and he had a hair star, Hagim, very, very nice young grandma. And uh, it's a very uh, nice and successful kolei. That's a sudden, kolei here in Deal. Yeah. yeah okay. All of a sudden, this man was very, and he built a building next to the synagogue. He first he bought the land, we didn't want to buy it, against the, against the consensus of the committee of the very, he got other private people. Now, he does very th- many things unilaterally, we got, uh, and that's, anyways. and there were no students, so he brought the 12, 14 students from Lakewood. So there's three, maybe I think three. Are there? Maybe there's three Sefaradim and all the others. He brought this Ashkenazim from Lakot and Permanent Kolel. Can you imagine how they, what, they were, what kind of uh, antagonism that creates? Not because they're Ashkenazim. Why are you opening another Kolel in competition with the other man? Wait, the new Kolel has the boys from Lakot? Oh, the new one. Okay. Not the one from Rabbi Diamond. No. Okay. okay. Rabbi Diamond, I think they're all. They're all Sephardim? Uh-huh. So this was, yeah, and now you stop to think what motivates a man like that to do this. Right. Do you find that the younger generation is in more of support of the more religious than the older generation? It depends. You see, you know, the problem is that the ones that you see that support more, they're the ones that are more, more vocal, and they're the ones that you see. Right. 
because obviously you go to synagogue, they are there. Right. Some of the others, maybe they're not there. Right. But the majority is not that. Right. We are more religiously inclined, I think this is generally in the United States, because of yeshivot. Right. I mean, this is very, that's a very simple right. thing to understand. I mean, you take when my son, I forgot, I told you, the sequence of events that happened, how my son was the first boy in the Sephardic community that went to yeshiva. And he went to flat with yeshiva. No, he didn't tell me that. Well, I was always c concerned. You see, our home has always been an observant home, religious home. My father, Hashem, was a businessman all the time, but he, he had a library which was mind-boggling. And, uh, I mean, he passed away. I was 17 years old, so I was very conscious of his mode of life. Were you the oldest? No, oh, I'm next to the youngest. Oh, it's David? David is the youngest. Yeah, is. Harry is yeah. older than I am, and the others have gone on, have passed away. I'm next to the youngest. And uh, he s learned Torah on the average probably during the course of a 24-hour day, I would say six to eight hours. And that was just a way of life. And outstanding that, he was a very elegant man, very elegant dresser, and a beautiful Van Dyke. He loved music, had a beautiful voice, as we, we, I mean, we trace it to his <laughs> side. And he was very knowledgeable in music. He was very sophisticated. He loved luxury. He loved a good time. Uh, he would be the first to go to a resort. Uh, he would be the first to go to a show by show. I mean, well, if there was a circus or something like that. He doesn't object to it. In other words, he always told us, Torah is made for you to live by and to enjoy it. I don't recall him ever reprimanding us or telling us, this is what you must do. He always told us, Torah is beautiful. In order for you to enjoy it, you have to understand it. If you understand it, you love it. And that was it. It's wonderful. And so you say, how did he put so much time? He was a businessman. Well, these people, they all get up earlier, 4 or 5 o'clock in the morning, they have to get up and make a little Turkish coffee. He sit and studies. Oh, the books were not always next to him. I never, I remember. You know, I think of my father. He has an open book with a pair of glasses on it, here, there, and everywhere. <laughs> this, is the, this is the way I visualize it. Time for uh, the fill in the morning, he went to the synagogue and he went. They always had to show before he came back home. He'd have breakfast and go to business. They don't eat out, like mm -hmm. us. Mm -hmm. Okay, 3, 3, 30, 4 o'clock, he's back home. He have a little something, a little bite, and he had a study group home. That was a very choice study group, four, five, six people. He was Michael Bell as well. Mm -hmm. He was very instrumental in convincing Rabbi Jacob Kasson to stay here. He was a shaliyah. He came one year and next year in Mayo. Because at the time, Rabbi Kassin was also in Kabbalah, he was studying Kabbalah, he was telling me he wanted to. Mm. How often did he study Kabbalah? Mm. Is that part of his regular? Part of, no, no, part of his regular studies. Mm. He studies everything. He studied everything. And uh, so then he, he has supper. He has supper afterwards. Sure, he listened to music. He loved, he loved to listen to that. Oh, he had a terrific sense of humor. He was always joking. And when he walked into the synagogue, the young and the old, the old they all had a laugh on him. He had to find a nice thing to say. or a joke to crack or something. And he was very, very much against people who just found ways to make Isur. I'll never forget the day they always used to call him Abraham anyways, but he wasn't a rabbi. His name was Abraham Tavim? Abraham. He uh, was a, a very, very nice, very religious man. Shana, his name was David Shana. Very, very... And uh, tuna fish, no, he can't eat tuna fish. So they eat what? What can they eat? They either eat bananas or tuna fish. There's nothing else they can eat. There's a tuna, a tuna fish is not, is not kosher. He said, "Who said?" Acham David Shema. Of course, he was David Shema. I was younger than him. Acham David. Why are you saying tuna fish is not kosher? Well, you know, we don't know that. You don't know. First, you have to find out. But it was just, you know, these people, this is all they have to eat when they're in the city, when they're down of time, and they have this, hey, you're going to forbid it for them. If this is, if the tuna fish is not kosher, they'll eat something else that's not kosher as well. And you can't show that. You find some way to make it easy for them. Anyways, this was, we live by this. This is always our philosophy. Maybe at times we transgress. God forgive us. You know. But we transgress not not, we don't say, okay, this is against halakha, or that way halakha, you should do it. No, we, weren't con we didn't control ourselves. But uh, the, like the other day, this Shabbat, precisely Shabbat, I'm sitting in my seat, there's a pamphlet in front of me, how to have a kedush in your home. The Banu Shalom, it was a printed one. If one has to go through that, has to make a kedush, you should stop making a kedush in your house. It's a celebration. To tape the closets, to, uh, to take the... There was so much, I don't know. These are extremities which are... It's not us. 
It's not us. So why would you? I've heard extreme things. I've never heard of taping the closets. So that when you get the people that do the help, they shouldn't take a plate that could not have been uh, co uh, oh, for dairy right. or for meat. That's no, right. for meat or for right. dairy. They right. shouldn't make a mistake. Okay. You have no idea. And the, 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 the lights before in advance. And the, uh, well, of course, they do. And I mean, <laughs> nobody puts lights on and so on. So, but so many sayagim, sayagim, and the sayagim, and the sayagim. I read, it was six pages, each page the size. What is this? Do you, do you attribute all this? What do you attribute it to? I attribute it to extremism and I attribute it to lack of knowledge. That's mm -hmm. why I attribute it to it. Now, and the proof of that is that most of the very strong supporters are ones who are new converted to observance. Mm -hmm. and they don't know much. And their most vulnerable ones are the ones that have had a, a, a tragedy in the home. And that's when they're most vulnerable. And, uh, okay, which is good. You bring right. them to a religion. I'm not against that. Right. See, well, the trouble I is, I know. The trouble is, you can't talk against. The, the, they have when you hide behind the banner of religion, you have a person like me at a disadvantage. Oh, you're against religion. I'm not against religion. Right. So I'm with that. You, you want to stop this? You want, no, not that. So all of a sudden, it becomes are you for or against religion? Right. Observance mm -hmm. or, or not? Or not observance. So you can't like just kind of everywhere. Thinking of having a general meeting this Shabbat for a lot of things happened wrong here in the last few months. And some of my uh, colleagues and friends, and he says, you know, we're at a disadvantage. And you are know, oh, you're against studying of Torah? Because we, re we resent very much the fact that this Kodesh is open next to the synagogue. First of all, it's created by a monster among the Goyim here. And they came and they threw bricks at the windows and they threw them adults, you know, adults, men. And it creates much ill feeling towards us. And it's not needed. Mm -hmm. Not only it's not needed, he hurt Rabbi Diamond's feelings very much. He was supposed to be his buddy buddy. Rabbi, when he goes away, this Rabbi doesn't allow anybody else to only Rabbi Diamond because he knows he can't usurp any of his... He's busy. <laughs> we have Rabbi Nahumas. Probably more knowledgeable than both of them. Rabbi Diamond as well as Rabbi. I mean, this literally, I mean, I'm not just exaggerating. He's a man that studies Torah 10 hours a day very knowledgeable. He's a Hazan, but he's very, very tremendous Tamid HaKhan. More as value to us is more as a Tamid HaKhan than as a Hazan, anyways. Wouldn't allow him to speak. He's afraid that he should. And the man at home is a Halabi and he's of our deliberate leaning inclinations. He doesn't want anybody to undercut this. No, and it's not even? At home. At home. But, I don't know, this you know, it's so interesting because many, of course, as you know, many of the same issues in the Ashkenazi community. Well, and, well this is what we were trying. Anyway, this is what we have always been very fortunate. Like, I'm not going to say proud, but we've been fortunate that we have not, have not been tainted with that. Yeah. Until then, uh, you know my brother Isaac. Mm -hmm. He, in his last years, he lived here all year round for maybe five or six years. And he was, all my brothers were always, he was president of Shah Sion at one time, he every time he didn't want to make a present, he wouldn't take it, he wouldn't accept it. Well, the top senior, he says, well, you watch what's going to be in this community 10, 12 years down the road with this rabbi. Sure enough, that's what's happening. Hmm. And uh, we were never that our community was always just one unit. And uh, now there's so much vision between children and parents, between cousins, between friends, between brothers, one is this way, the other is not. We never had that. Mm. We never had that. It is in the Ashkenazi, unfortunately. It exists in the Ashkenazi, but we never had it. Do you think it's partly due to Ashkenazi influence in terms of yeah. people going to... Yes. Yeah. Yeah. What's up here? From now, I think, to the 16th, the 16th, the 17th, there's a concert of Hazanim from all over the world. Mm -hmm. And uh, Sion is going, Yaskel Sion, as well as Nahari. Wow. They're going to attend. Nahari attended last year also. And just yesterday they called me, they called me to go to represent the community and to give them a resume of the background of our... But I just put in a call, he's not in, I can't go. 
Hmm. I got out of the engagement of my grandson just a few days after that. It means if I go, I'd have to go to Israel and come back in four days. It's just a big uh, yeah. hassle to be, uh, ride on the airplane for 40 hours, back and forth, 30 hours or so. That's well, too bad you can't go. <laughs> yeah, so I would have liked to be there. And I, you know, we could, I could add a lot, to, but it's just too much. Hmm. Do you find that these um, issues in terms of, I, it's, as you said, it's hard to say that it's an issue between religious and not religious because the people, like, as you're claiming, you're not claiming not to be religious, but I don't know how else to describe it. I mean, you have, no, sort of have... the extremists. Extremists, the extremists, extremists okay. Mahmiri, Mahmiri. Uh, the Mahmiri, the ones who are Mahmiri. But you see, the main thing is, besides Mahmiri, is that they're not Arman Hagim. Now, we, you know, I mean, you're familiar with Shah Maruch. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we know you have Maram and you have Murat. Mm -hmm. We don't have him. The other was appendix then added by Ashkenazi. Right. Right. Uh, well, the Ramah. Ramah, what's his name? Um, uh, it's not Luria. No. No, no it's just anyway, the Ramah. Ramah. Yes. Uh, Ramah. The person added, right. I mean, it was a beautiful, beautiful Shulchan Aruch, exactly what, uh, what uh, Maran did. And uh, then this was added because of the Minhagim of the Ashkenazim. Fine. But we do not adhere to them. Right. So, uh, this is the conflict that's creating. That's why I tell you that when they hide behind the banner of, re of, of religiosity, and then now they tell you, so they want to put you in that kind of a light. Like all this time when I'm opposing you, they tell oh, uh, the Shonara, of course, is wrong, but not against Motau. It becomes that. Uh, even if I say so myself, some of the extremists in your in the Ashkenazim, they'll stop at nothing. Nothing. The end justifies the means. There's no question about it. They'll, they'll hit, they'll kill, they'll, 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 nothing. They won't, they won't stop at anything. They'll talk about they're, they're, they're just extremists. They, they get carried away. Right. I mean, you don't have to go back. You go to uh, in, in Israel, in Yerushalayim, the Drekarta. All you have to do is the, look at that section and get it. But that's fortunately a very small group. Yes. But yeah. you're right. You're absolutely right. But, but that's the extremism. Yeah. That's what carries them there. And yet, There's a very beautiful book. It's out of print, giving depicting the background of Sefaradim throughout the whole world. I don't even have a copy here. I had one and I lost it. It's by uh, El Azar. As a matter of fact, uh, I, I gave a discourse on it and it referred to some of the passages in that book. In Florida, when I was, maybe 40 guys said, I want that book. And I asked the center to get it. My daughter Sheila, as it happened, gave me that book. She didn't give me. I was in her house, and I picked it up. One of these days, when you were there, yeah. it has pretty large library. What's there. the title of the book? Is it in Hebrew? Or the other Jews, not the, English. The other Jews. The other Jews. Okay. And uh, it's, it's 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 the 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 research behind it is terrific, because he he gives you the background of practically every Sephardi congregation in the United States, hmm. and he's accurate because when I read ours, to the T. What is that? And then he brings in, in Israel what's happening to the Sephardim over there and what happened to the evolution of the, uh, the, the Sephardim, the importance of the Sephardim there as it takes place and so on and so forth. And it's, a very, it's, a very, it's a brilliantly written book and very, very uh, true and authentic. I still can't get it. Uh, it's called The Other Jews by El Azar. What's his first name? I forgot his first name. Rabbi, uh, I, I was mentioning it, and Rabbi uh, Fa'ur says, Oh, yeah, Al-Azhar, he says, Yes, I read that. Rabbi, Rabbi Dweck heard that I made a discourse and uh, also quoted that book, and he's trying to he couldn't get it. <laughs> the other thing I was asking, for, and I says, Rabbi, I wanted 50 books for my, for my friends over there, and I couldn't get them. Hmm. They don't publish it anymore? Maybe they're going to publish it again. Oh, so far now, it's out of print. Hmm. Very, very informative book. If you, I, I've just been involved with getting books that are out of print. There are places that, that will search for books See if you could find that. I could use 50 of them. Okay. 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 I'll okay. let you know. Then it'll go through the center. The center one, that's their trying. Very hard. Yeah, yeah I'll let you know what I can do. I mean, I said the ones who are more extreme, do you find, are they still adhering to, you know, in terms of the, in, in Tefillah, are they still adhering to the Mahamat and still yes. adhering to all Yes, 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 that's... That, that's established. That's as far as the uh, 
the whole mode of the tefillah is the same. Mm -hmm. It does not there's no change. There's, they haven't made any changes to the tefillah. No, no. No, not at all. Hmm. And uh, really, I appreciate what Sam Catton and his friends, the last book also, David was involved. The new Sidur, that one. Uh, yeah. You found an introduction there. Uh, it's it's to be uh, really appreciated that, that they're taking the, because it takes a lot of time and effort to do this, mm -hmm. and because it's it it makes it easier for the less knowledgeable individuals to follow mm -hmm. the the when it's being said led by Yasubur or at home when they're mm -hmm. when they're praying. I mean, like you take this. This book is just, this is fabulous. Yeah, it's this is a good book. Yeah. It's fabulous. I mean, it's so simple. You don't, you know, for the not knowledgeable individuals, it makes it so, so simple. You just open it. That's all. One, two, three, go. And, mm -hmm. one, one, and even for the ones that are knowledgeable, it makes it much easier, much simpler. You don't have to depend on your memory. And was it, there? yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, it's there. Right. Very, it's very, very informative. Very good. Very well done. One thing that I liked about it is that the different parts of the service that are sung, like during Shacharit, um, are all like separated out. Like, for example, um, I mean, there's always just learning things. For example, when Shabbat Anim yes. is said, I mean, it's already separated out. You know, it's going to happen. Yes. Also, Kel Hadad. And Yumi Tsarim Gel Tan. I mean, yes. I mean all, all throughout, it was, it's really yes. kind of. Yeah, and smash him to say time. I mean, they have yeah. little dots, you know, that, that's, so you know, that that's a little separate. Yeah. I mean, that was really, that helped me in sort of learning. Uh, yes. Yeah. 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 Oh, that's, that's really, that's great. In some ways, this is easier to follow than the Sidor. Of course, because it's so orderly yeah. that uh, you don't have to turn from one person to another. Are you of making you just going to order? The well, this Sidor was just done, and I, I criticized it some. And that uh, there are some things that were left out. Uh, but it's not done as elaborately as this. Right. See, in these, right. uh, like these separations that you just mentioned and so on, it's not done as elaborately as that. But, oh, yeah, still, this is very good. Yeah. There's, also, there's also another one that I saw that was done by some place called the Aleppian Society. I think it was much, a little bit earlier, and I think... Um, there's a few. Of, um, I think it was called Beit Yosef. Was Beit Yosef. Was the name of the city? Yes, Beit Yosef. That's, uh, but you see that many of that Beit Yosef, uh, it was... Uh, it's printed in Israel, first of all. It's done in Israel. And there are many, uh, not many, there are some things, even though it's our Minhagim, mean, <laughs> our uh, system, but there are some which are taken from there. For example, in the, uh, the Hanunim, on Yom Shani and Hamishi, on weekdays I'm talking. Mm -hmm. uh, we say Ve'abor four times. This is other than so something I'm not familiar with. <laughs> This is right after the Amidah? Yeah, after the Amidah, after, okay. yeah, after the Hazara. Right. After the Hazara. Well, what do you, what, and what do you call this? We call this Tahanun. Tahanunim. Yeah, oh, okay. Yes, Tahanunim. Right. Uh, now we say four times by Ya'abu. Okay. Uh, we, in our Minhag, in Aram Sobah, on, here's the Tahanunim for Yom Shani Bahamashi. There's, here's another by Ya'abu, and then they say, and she Avadu, Kel Melech, another by Ya'abu. Okay. We only say we say this only on Monday, and we do not say this kina mm -hmm. on Monday. On the other hand, on Thursday we say this one. We do not say this one. Mm -hmm. What happened to the other way? Mm -hmm. So at the end of the tahanunim, we have we this book has just inserted the Yabor because supposed, we're supposed to say right. it four times. Right. The other Israeli, yes, I have that other book. Yeah. Okay.
So now the other the other siddur does not have it. Uh-huh. Does not have the four statements of the vayavor? Vi- vi- does not have it there because it's not needed because they say the two pieces of the hanunim. Uh-huh. The portions of the hanunim, they say them both. Even this. This one, which is a very, this is a very fine sedur. It's a wonderful sedur because it has many perushim. halachot, perushim, and explanations. Is this a halab sedur or is it in Israel? No, this is done over there in the, in Yerushalayim, but it's supposed to adhere to Aaron Hagim. What's the name of this sedur? This, this is sedur imrafi, but in perush hegion lebi. This is a very fine book. Mm-hmm. In Perush, Higyon Le Bay. See, again, they don't have a Yabur here. Mm-hmm. But that's because their Minhag is to say both of the portions on every day, mm-hmm. on, on, both on Monday and, uh, and uh, Thursday, whereas we don't. Right. So the Halab custom is not to say it. Not to say the two parts, the, the two, two parts, parts, but we do say the Yabor at the yeah, end here, before okay. we say the Kaddish. So this is, this is just Eidat Mizrach? Um, yes, Mizrach? yes, Eidat Mizrach. Okay. Okay. Yes, okay. except that uh, they have a Minhag over there that they say them both. We, okay. maybe for Torah Subur we don't say, I mean, okay. maybe originally it was established that you don't say both Kinot, both uh, of this, the Hanunim, Parsh of the Hanunim, because of just uh, Torah Subur, so it shouldn't mm-hmm. take that long, the prayer shouldn't take that long. That's the mm-hmm. only explanation I can find for it. Mm-hmm. So they say, we'll say this one on Monday, this one we'll say on Thursday. Mm-hmm. But the way Abor, you cannot skip. You need to right. say four times the Abor. Any other differences between that Sidur and... Uh... Uh, and which, on this one? Yeah. No, there are. There are some, uh, well, the, the, some of the corrections that I want to make are for the benefit of Hazanim, but not, not knowledgeable. For example, I want them to insert... Uh, uh, you see, there are many... Uh, let's say when they come to the Parashiyot, mm-hmm. uh, for the weekdays, or parashiot for a particular special reading, be it one of the Arba Samot or the Shabi Ab. You see, they, they have the, uh, the parasha, they don't tell you where it's from. Mm-hmm. Now somebody that doesn't know, how is he going to find it? Or how are you going to remember? Mm-hmm. I mean, in order for me to remember parashat of, uh, of uh, let's say, uh, Shabi Ab, mm-hmm. where is it? What parasha is it in? Yeah, it's very simple to just put in Ba'at Hanan. Yeah. Put in Parashat Vayet Hanan. Uh-huh. Not only that, I, mean, I also intend that they should put also the Sefer. The Marim Vayet Hanan. Here you have to go and fish and find out where is this part. Where is it? Right. Kitolit Banim. You know, the Parashat of the other, right. Kitolit Banim. Right. Where are you going to find it? Yeah. So these are some of the corrections. Uh, on Purim, if Purim is on, on Musa'i Shabbat, how are you supposed to go about it? What do you do? Do you make, do you make the Havdala? Before you say the, before you read the Megala? Or don't you? Good question. Uh, and I think you say it after, don't you? After. But you do make Berchat uh, Me'orei Aesh. Mm-hmm. And the reason should be very simple for anybody to figure out. You need lights. You're going to read the Megillah, you're going to read that. So you make Amos Aesh, but you make Berchat Me'orei Aesh. You light all the lights that you want. Now you can light lights and finish, all right? And then they have the lights made afterwards. Right. Afterwards. And uh, this, I just remember, so they have to, uh, we're in Florida, so the next day, no, they do that. I said, this is where they, they called New York, and I said, how, and then, so I said, how did you, how did you figure it? I, said, I seem to remember, and then besides, it's logical. So I say, these things, don't leave them for guesswork. Or don't leave any open questions. Put this information. There is, we have, I have a custom in my house, we read the portions of Zohar on Friday night during the Kedush, and on Saturday before the Kedush. Hmm. Zohar, I don't know if you people have that. Yeah. And Friday night, we have the Shabbat, 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 the the first edition of this, first editions. And I said, why don't you put it? He said, I don't say it. I said, well, we say it. We say it. Maybe in your family, you say it. It should have it. So it's on Friday night and Saturday morning. Yeah, so they put Friday night. They didn't put Saturday morning. I said, because it's hand, And we went to Shabbat, and I said, well, you're saving one half a page. Then they're doing it, you know, to save so many pages to make the... Yep. Who? Okay.